So the whole thing about anointing service is really just to consciously take a moment and say, Holy Spirit, come and touch my life. Fill me again, fill me anew, fill me for the first time, perhaps. But I don't want to do life in my own strength and by my own wisdom. And so I've been told this message, a fresh anointing. If I would add a subtitle, it would be a fresh anointing for a new day. And I don't think I need to convince anybody that in every sense, it's not just with the beginning of a new year, but in every sense, we have entered into a new kind of day in the way the world has changed over the past year. I love this passage in Psalm 92 and verse 10, and I'm reading it from the Passion Translation. It says, your anointing has made me strong and mighty, given me strength. You empowered my life for triumph, for victory, by pouring fresh oil over me. And oil throughout the scripture, if you're not aware, is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. And that's why we anoint people with oil. Our theme for the year comes from the book of Joel, which is, I will restore, the Lord declares. And Joel prophesies to a people and into a situation who've been devastated by one crisis after the other, after the other, after the other. It's pictured as successive waves and swarms of locusts devastating everything. And the little that's left over, the next wave eats up. And into the middle of that sense of hopelessness and chaos, God promises to restore not just the one year of loss, and I want to really emphasize this and will continue to emphasize it, not just the one year of loss, but the years of loss. And in order to activate that, he calls us, his people, to seek his face in repentance. And repentance is a simple word that simply means to change your mind, change direction. You are heading in one way. Now turn and consciously, intentionally seek the Lord. And in that very act, you turn away from whatever was wrongdoing in your life when you turn towards what is right. That's what repentance is. In prayer and in fasting, and we're in a 20-day season of prayer and fasting. And there's successive calls to this in the book of Joel, but in Joel 2 verse 15 and 16, he says, blow the trumpet in Zion. Declare a holy fast, a sacred assembly. Gather the people, gather the children. And I love that because a part of this service and our next one, and whether you're doing this at home, please include the children. And we've made special allowance to include the children in this anointing because this is an anointing not just for individuals, but for families and for every single person. And into that, God says, I will restore you. And then he also says, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. I want you to notice the word of promise that he's given. The Lord says, this is not somebody's opinion. This is not somebody's good idea. This is not somebody just caught up in some kind of fantasy. But this is the word of the Lord. The Lord says, I will restore. I will give you back what you lost. And I just want to take a moment to emphasize that thought. The Lord says, every year in our church, we encourage people not only to come to the anointing service or in this instance, to do it in your home with friends, with family, and and just receive that fresh anointing from the Lord. But also to ask God, what's my word for the Lord? For a church, it's restore. For you, it could be something else. And with that word that kind of just will focus your year, God's heart for your, you this year, to say, well, give me a scripture or two that backs that up. It's your word of promise for 2021, the Lord says. And that's the power of daily coming into the word of God. And again, just a reminder, every week our church does a series out of the Bible app. And just, you can connect to it. It's a very simple thing of spending a few moments every single day in God's Word. And the power of daily devotion is enormous. And if you miss a day or two, don't get the guilt. Just pretend you did it and get a fresh touch today. 
And I'm not trying to be trite in that. It's just sometimes we get so caught up in the guilt of missing or getting behind that God says, all right, I know you're behind, but I want to speak to you today. And so just move on with it. This is what the Lord says. Because there's something about God's Word that is so incredibly powerful in your life every single day. 2 Timothy 3 verse 16 and 17 in the New Living Translation, all Scripture is inspired by God. And that literally means written by the Holy Spirit, by the very breath of God. And I want you to catch that. The very breath of God is upon every single word. And when you read it, it's powerful. It's not just ink and pages or screen and text. It has the breath of God on it when you open God's Word. All Scripture is inspired by God. And He's useful to teach us what is true. So it really doesn't matter what politicians may say, and I'm not trying to be disrespectful of them, or the movie star who has an opinion about something. We can listen to their opinion, glean something from that. But what does God's Word say about what's going on in your life and in your world? So the Scripture is useful to teach you what is true to make you realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip His people to do every good work. This year, make it a year of preparing and equipping as you anchor your life in the Word of God. I was listening recently to a discussion that was led by a believer called Rabbi Jason Sobel. And he said, only two things in all of creation have the breath of God in them, the Word of God and the soul of man. And when they connect, when they connect, the breath of God in you with the breath of God upon the Word of God, something powerful, something incredible begins to happen in your life. I've talked a bit about the breath of God. We're talking about the Spirit of God. It's just one of the ways God's Holy Spirit is described in Scripture. And Joel's promise that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh becomes fulfilled on the day of Pentecost. And in a sense, and I don't have time to get into all of this, but the day of Pentecost is a new creation event. Even as God's Spirit moved upon the chaos and the darkness in Genesis, so in this new creation, the people of God were in darkness, in chaos, in frustration. And God pours out of His Spirit like a rushing mighty wind. Where they were in the upper room, they were all filled and the power of the Holy Spirit. And just as a people were created out of the act of God and the moving of the Spirit and the Word of God in Genesis chapter 1, so in Acts chapter 2, a new people are created, the church of the living God, the ecclesia, those called out into the marketplace of life to be witnesses unto Jesus. And Peter, trying to explain all that is going on on this day, says this, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, says God, I will pour out my spirit on all people, on all flesh. And he expounds on that, that it's even the slaves, it's the men, it's the women, it's the children. And we kind of go, oh, that's nice, but we miss it. That, that in the Old Testament, only kings and prophets and a few others had the outpouring of the Spirit. And he says, no, I'm going to pour out on anybody. And slaves were considered persona non grata. And it's even on those. God says, no, I love them as well. I'm going to pour out my Spirit on them. And I want you to open your heart and hunger for this fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Because by the power of the Holy Spirit, God wants to do a whole lot of things. And I just want to touch on a few of those things. The first thing he says, and I believe he's saying to us today, is he wants you to breathe again. There's something about the pressure of life and the attack of the enemy on our lives where he kind of squeezes the breath out of us. We even have a phrase that I'm sure many of you have used in this past year. I just need to catch my 
breath. Because there's that feeling, I'm suffocating, I'm rushing here, I'm under pressure there, this has gone wrong, that has changed, that's happening, I don't know how to handle this. And I, I just need to catch my breath. And God says, I want you to breathe again. Not just oxygen, but breathe in my Holy Spirit. Breathe in my Holy Spirit. Because we were created to carry the breath of God. In Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7, the Lord formed man out of the dust of the earth and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And he became a living being. I love that picture. In all the rest of creation, God had spoken and it happened. But here in a moment of tenderness, of intimacy, God out of the clay, the dust of the earth, fashions and shapes a human body and leans over and breathes his breath. It's intimate, it's powerful, it's connected. And we mean to carry that breath of God within us. And so it's no wonder that in the chaos, in the darkness after the crucifixion of Jesus, that when he's resurrected, he appears to them in the upper room. And listen to his words. Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And just in that moment, he's speaking three powerful things into their lives. As he's kind of saying to them, breathe again. I know the chaos of the last three days has literally crushed the breath out of you. You're going, I just need to catch my breath. He said, well, breathe again. And he imparts peace. He imparts purpose. As the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. you there's a reason you're on the planet. You, there's a reason you're a part of God's story. And then he says, receive the Holy Spirit. There's empowerment. And I wonder if just where you are, whether watching online or watching on delay or here in the auditorium, you just take a moment right now to just slow things down and go, I breathe in the Holy Spirit, the breath of life. I receive peace. I receive purpose. I receive power by the Holy Spirit. The second thing is God wants to help you. He wants you to breathe again, but he wants you to get help again. Everything in our society pushes us to self-dependence, self-sufficiency. And we were created to be in a trust relationship with God, to live dependent upon him. It doesn't mean to be pathetic or powerless, but just to be dependent, to include God in every part of your every day. And there's so much about the work of the Holy Spirit in Romans chapter 8. But I just want to connect two simple things, verse 15 and verse 26, where he says, The Spirit you received does not make you slaves, that you should live in fear again. Perhaps there's a sense of fear just hanging over your life, a sense of dread about the future, of uncertainty. God's not in the fear. God is in the faith. And he said, I, I didn't send my spirit to allow you to be captured by fear again, but rather the spirit you received brought about your adoption, brought about your connection, your relationship with God. That by him we call Abba Father. It says, Daddy. It's not Father, official, distant, cold. It's Daddy. He says, the Holy Spirit has put within you that capacity to call out to your heavenly father and say, Daddy, I need your help. And then in verse 26, he's connecting that thought in the same way as the Spirit has been imparted to you to remove fear, in the same way as the Spirit has been imparted to you that you can enter this intimate relationship with your heavenly father, Abba, Father, Daddy. It says in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. And then he illustrates it with prayer. One of the things we struggle with maybe the most, how do we pray? What do we say when we feel like we have no words? But it's bigger than just helping with prayer. It's helping with everything. And the word weakness there is limitation, weakness, a lack of capacity to handle what's before us. 
And usually for us, weakness leads us to frustration and exasperation. But God wants our weakness to lead us to a place of faith and trust. When we feel inadequate, instead of feeling condemned before God, we say, God, I know this feeling of weakness is here because this is the moment I need to put my trust in you. You know what's going on. You know what the next step is. You know the wisdom for the situation. You know the direction I should take. You see, in Christ... When you belong to Jesus in Christ, weakness is a badge of honor and the platform from which the power of God begins to flow in your life. I'd love it if we could have the Apostle Paul sitting next to me and interviewing about weakness because he talks about it a lot. I encourage you, go read 2 Corinthians 13 in particular. But the word help here is a phenomenal word. And it's so limited in the English translation of it because Paul, trying to describe what the Holy Spirit wants to do in your life and in my life, takes three Greek words, connects them together to make one word. And I'm not even going to try and pronounce it. It's an amazing word though. And literally what it describes, that if you were doing a toss, for example, of carrying an enormous log from a tree that has been chopped down, the Holy Spirit would come alongside and say, you go take the light end. I'll carry the heavy end. It's not that you do nothing because God loves partnership. That's what faith is, partnership with Him. He says, you go take the light end. I want you to be a part of this, but I'll carry the heavy end of the log and let's go do this together. So God wants you to breathe again. He wants you to get help again. He wants you to be led again. And this anointing service and this inviting of the Holy Spirit to come upon us. Say, I want to be led by the Spirit. Jesus promised in John 14 and other places that he would send the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit would be our advantage. And he would guide us and he'd teach us and he'd lead us. And Paul picks up on this in a number of passages, but Galatians 5 and verse 25. Since then we are living by the Spirit. Let us follow the Spirit's leading on Sundays so that we sing holy and proper. Now he says in every part of our lives, I wonder what situation you're facing at work perhaps in a relationship breakdown, perhaps in some other area of your life, to just say, Holy Spirit, would you speak to me and would you lead me? Would you speak to me? Would you lead me? And when you open your heart to like it, often it's retrospective. You look back and go, the Lord led me. I asked, I was still a bit anxious in the moment, but because I reached out in my weakness and I said, I trust you and I trust you'd lead me, you led me. So if you want to be led by the Holy Spirit, you need to develop a relationship, encourage you to talk to him and say, Holy Spirit, would you help me in this moment as I go into this meeting, as I do this or I do that, would you help me with this? I love 2 Corinthians 13 verse 14, the benediction the blessing that is spoken over the church at Corinth and over us. May the amazing grace of the Master Jesus Christ, the extravagant love of God, and here it is, and the intimate fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. The intimate fellowship. The final thing I want to speak to, and there's many things the Spirit does in our life, breathe again, get help again, be led again, but prophesy again. Joel says, and Paul picks it, Peter picks it up in the book of Acts when he explains what's going on with the day of Pentecost. Read it for yourself, a little bit of homework, Acts chapter 2. I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. The amazing thing, and I don't have a lot of time to touch on it today, is that according to the Jewish calendar, we have just entered the year 5780, and it is enormously significant, but it means there's, those numbers mean something in the Hebrew lettering because the letters are numbers, and we'll go there one day. But it's the decade of the mouth. 
The last decade apparently was the decade of the eyes to see what God was doing. But this is now the decade of declaring something, the decade of the mouth. And I wonder if it's any coincidence that in the beginning of the decade of the mouth, COVID turns up. People have to wear masks. You're not meant to sing in church. And we will continue to obey those instructions for our safety. This is not a, a statement of rebellion because church is not the only place you can sing. It's not the only place you can prophesy over your life. It's not the only place you can declare God's promises. So don't misread what I'm saying at this moment. But in the decade of the mouth, the enemy is doing everything he can to silence you. And I want to say to you, prophesy again. Begin to speak the promises of God over your life. Begin to declare the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Begin to declare a season of breakthrough and of advancing. And whatever the enemy has done for evil, God will turn for good in your life. And many of us feel... Many of us feel powerless in that situation. And I love the words where Moses is struggling with God wants what with God with what God wants him to do. He's been isolated from people, relatively speaking, for 40 years, looking after the sheep in the desert. And God now wants him to become the spokesperson for deliverance. I want you to catch that. The spokesperson for deliverance starting with his own life. And he says, I don't know what to say. I'm not good with words. And God says, excuse me, who made the mouth? Who made the tongue? I can quicken your lips. I can quicken your tongue. Now go, I will help you speak and teach you what to say. And again, we come back to that whole thing of the power of devotions, hearing the word of God, hearing the promises of God. It may not be every single day, but God will speak to you through those devotions. There'll be promises and things you need to declare over your life, over your family, over your circumstance, over your finances, and begin to prophesy again. This is a whole message in and of itself, but I just want to dangle the hook for a moment. Ezekiel 37. God, by the Spirit, takes Ezekiel to the burial ground of a place where Israel was defeated. It's strewn with skeletons, with all the evidence of a defeat that was enormous, that was devastating. And he says, do you think this army can live again? Do you think these bones can rise again and become a powerful army of the Lord? And I love Ezekiel's response. He says, oh, Lord, only you know. That's wisdom. That's wisdom. And God says to him, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath into you, the spirit into you, and you will come to life. And you need to identify the dry bones in your life. Lost promises, maybe wrong actions, sinful actions, things where you go, that's a cemetery there, that's dead. No, it's time to prophesy to the dry bones. It's time to prophesy to those dried up promises and say, Holy Spirit, come and quicken these things again. And I am prophesying blessing. I'm prophesying favor. I'm prophesying breakthrough over my life and over my family and over my circumstances, over my nation, over my business, whatever it is that you need to prophesy on. But all of this will only take place if you have a real connected relationship with the living God. And you can only do that by saying yes to Jesus. We are separated from God by our own brokenness and our own sin. That's why Jesus came. The cross becomes a bridge across the gulf that separates us from God. And the cross becomes the bridge that we come across. Jesus accomplished everything on the cross and in the power of his resurrection so that you and I could be reconciled to God, fully forgiven, set free, washed clean, brought into a right relationship. And the scripture says, if you publicly declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, 
And if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you will experience salvation. I love that. You will experience salvation. 